Job chapter 3. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. He said, May the day of my birth perish, and the night that said, A boy is conceived. That day, may it turn to darkness. May God above not care about it. May no light shine on it. May gloom and utter darkness claim it once more. May a cloud settle over it. May deck may blackness overwhelm it. That night, may thick darkness seize it. May it not be included among the days of the year, nor be entered in any of the months. May that night be barren. May no shout of joy be heard in it. May those who curse days curse that day. Those who are ready to rouse Leviathan. May its morning stars become dark. May it wait for daylight in vain and not see the first rays of dawn. For it did not shut the doors of the womb on me to hide troubles from my eyes. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? Why were there knees to receive me and breasts that I may be nursed? For now I would be lying down in peace. I would be asleep and at rest with kings and rulers of the earth who built for themselves places now lying in ruins, with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver? Or why was I not hidden away in the ground like a stillborn child, like an infant who never saw the light of day? There the wicked cease from turmoil, and there the weary are at rest. Captives also enjoy their ease. They no longer hear the slave drivers shout. The small and the great are there, and the slaves are freed from their owners. Why is light given to those in misery, and life to the bitter of soul? To those who long for death that does not come, who search for it more than for hidden treasure, who are filled with gladness and rejoice when they reach the grave. Why is life given to a man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For sighing has become my daily food. My groans pour out like water. What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness. I have no rest, but only turmoil. Very different Job we see in chapter 3 from what we've seen in chapters 1 and 2. In chapters 1 and 2, Job was trusting in God, serving God, accepting whatever came to him, however devastating the calamity might be, or now how deprived he is of good health and overwhelmed with sickness and decay in his own body. But now, he wishes he was never born. He wishes he was never born. Job, the blameless, upright man, Job, the wise man, is in actual fact dimmed in his wisdom. Not blinded, but dimmed. We're going to see how Job will... will, Uh, work through a whole range of issues. But let me just say say this. One of the issues for Job in his calamity, and this is going to uh, go through the book, is that it's not the problem for him is that it feels like his sins haven't been forgiven. Have a look at chapter 7. Verse 21. Why do you not pardon my offences and forgive my sins? For I will soon lie down in the dust and you will search for me, but I will be no more. He knows he's a man who has sinned. And that's why he offers sacrifices, no doubt for himself, but we know he don't does so for his children. Why then is this happening? 
And I think we can all resonate with that. How many times have you heard people say, Christians say, why me? This is so unfair. Why has God taken my child? Why does my wife have a chronic illness? Why have I lost my job or my reputation? And what Satan will always do is seek to undermine your trust in God. Satan's seeking to undermine Job's trust in God in order to demonstrate that God is foolish in the way in which he saves. Because the attack is upon God. And what Job has done in chapters 1 and 2 is vindicate God's wisdom. And that's what we're about as Christians. We're to vindicate God's wisdom. That we can demonstrate to Satan, who tempts us, tries to pull us away, that in actual fact our trust is in God, come what may. And it may well be that you'll never know that trust until you're in your deepest, darkest hour. That sense in which you're over a cliff and all you're doing is hanging onto a rope. That's all there is. You can't help yourself. Any other person at the top of the cliff can pull you up by that rope. But now Job is so overwhelmed. And that description I gave of his physical ailments shows you this is an overwhelming experience that he's had. But now it's as if he curses the day of his birth. Doesn't curse God. But he wishes he was never born that this should happen. And then he's got these three friends here. And what I want you to do is, because I realised the next session is we're going to be short of time um, because you're going to go into discussion groups and discuss all these things and uh, do what you like. Uh, but just turn over, if you've got, you've got I, take, I, I did ask, you've got outlines, haven't you, of what I've been doing? <laughs> I've kind of been following the outlines, haven't I, sort of? Anyhow, turn over the page or the next page and what I want to do is tell you about the structure of the book and that will help you when you go to read the book as a whole. Uh, the book has... Uh, narrative, prose, at the beginning and the end. And the big chunk in the middle, chapters 3 to uh, basically 41, are uh, poetry, discourse. You've got this narrative at the beginning and the end and this poetry in the middle. But And the way in which it structures is this, and if you look at that diagram that I've produced for you, you've got Job's opening statement in chapter 3, if you look at chapter 4, you'll see that Eliphaz uh, is about to speak. Eliphaz is the oldest statesman of these three. Eliphaz is about to speak, and then uh, you'll see there, if, I, if you look at the, the diagram, or the, the table, or rather, Eliphaz speaks in chapters 4 and 5. Well, Eliphaz is going to speak, Job is going to respond. So Job responds in chapter 6 and 7. Well, then Bildad speaks. Notice Bildad's only going to speak for one chapter, chapter 8. But Job gives two chapters worth of reply, 9 and 10. Then Zophar, also a one-chapter guy, but now three chapters worth of reply from Job. Then chapter 15, Eliphaz has gone down to one chapter, but Job keeps going at, at two chapters, 16 and 17. Bildad finishes with chapter 18, and then Job just had chapter 19. Chapter 20 is Zophar, and chapter 21 is Job. 22, Eliphaz comes back on round three. Job, back in form, 23 to 24. Bildad, chapter 25, and then Job 26. Zophar is silenced. He's got nothing more to say. But Job still has more to say. So he does 27 to 28. 
Then after that, there's a closing statement of Job in 29 to 31, three chapters. And then a fourth character appears, namely Elihu. And he speaks for uh, six chapters, and then God speaks. And we see God speaking and Job re replies, he has two replies, God has two speeches. Part of the thematic approach to the book is the theme of silencing. You'll notice that Zophar is silenced and Bildad, El Eliphaz and Bildad are also silenced. Ultimately, Job is silenced and of course finally Satan is silenced. Satan doesn't appear again in this book. Satan uh, has nothing more to say because God's wisdom, when we get to the end of the book to, uh, after morning tea, uh, God's uh, uh, wisdom is vindicated in that respect. We see in the book of Job uh, patience. Uh, for those of you who had telegrams when you got married, that must be very old people in the room, I think. Uh, one of the favourite telegrams that people would send at wedding and read out at the wedding reception was, may you have the wisdom of Solomon, the patience of Job and the children of Israel. Uh, that sense in which this was a sort of a, 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 an Old Testament blessing uh, upon people. And it's true that Job is patient, but Job's wisdom is dimmed. There are some high points in Job, and uh, those high points come in chapters 11 and, and 19, and we'll, we'll look at those uh, in, in due course. But the patience of Job is dealing with his three friends. And the three friends uh, are Eliphaz, of course, and uh, Bildad and Zophar. Uh, Eliphaz is your pious mystic. He's your traditionalist, if you like. He, he's the one who says to Job, um, look, your problem with you, Job, is that um, you've sinned. Uh, you've, you've got, you're a specific example of the general principle of suffering. You suffer because you've sinned. Uh, man is not perfect, uh, so it's expected that uh, he'll be born to evil. And the problem with you is that you've sinned and you don't seem to realise it. The problem with Eliphaz is he doesn't recognise the gravity of Job's condition, nor does he recognise the righteousness of Job prior to these calamities taking place. As I said before, it's not uh, Eliphaz tries to point out where there are sins in Job's life. But the point that uh, I made before is that Job knows he has sins. The problem for him is he feels like they haven't been forgiven. It's not like he's got unrepented sins which is the challenge that Eliphaz is going to bring. You know, he thinks that he actually, uh, he, he, ha, he, he thinks that, why hasn't God forgiven me? Because normally, my normal experience has been uh, the, the blessings of God in my life. Why is it then that I haven't got that? Therefore, it's not my lack of repentance, it appears to be the lack of forgiveness from God, the lack of pardon. And that, that verse from chapter 7, I did know there are other verses uh, in, the, in the dialogue which, um, which demonstrate that. So that sense in which here we find Job uh, caught with these accusations uh, from his three friends. Bildad, on the other hand, uh, Bildad is the traditionalist. And he just, he just thinks in terms of uh, uh, the sole principle of, of which God is the guide that... Uh, we, retribution, retribution and justice comes. God only, and if only Job would admit his guilt, then we, we could, uh, we, we could un, undo this problem. 
But if he's going to hold fast to his integrity, when we know that he's a sinner, when we know that he's evil, and obviously these calamities are taking place because he's got secret sins that we don't even know about. It's a tit-for-tat relationship. Retributive justice from God against uh, the sin of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of human beings. So he actually speaks in such a way, but he, un- he misunderstands the, uh, the fact that it's folly to think like that and not wisdom. To work through the wisdom of God is to understand how we live in a life where you've got calamity and sickness and decay all around us. It's interesting. Uh, Eliphaz says, do you think that God trusts his servants? The irony is, that's exactly what God does do. God trusts Job. God's not giving any extra strength to Job. Job has all that he needs to respond in a godly fashion to the situation he finds himself. And God trusts Job that he will not curse him. Whenever you're tempted, remember this. God trusts you. You ever realise that? Did you know that God praises you? Ever thought about that? We often think of our praising God. How often do you think that God praises you? Just turn to uh, Romans chapter 2. A passage which I'm sure you've probably read many times, but perhaps haven't quite grasped the significance of what this passage is saying. It's the very end of chapter 2 of Romans. Paul has been speaking about uh, the way in which God circumcises the heart, and that's the true Jew. Not just the Jew who is circumcised in the flesh, but the true Jew is the one upon whose heart God has worked. There are lots of Jews in the Old Testament who were under judgment and lots of Jews who were circumcised. The whole circumcision aspect was there as a demonstration of having a circumcised heart or circumcised lips, clean heart, clean lips. And in the the discussion that Romans opens up with the the Jew-Gentile distinction, he goes, Jews thought you can't be saved unless you become a just Gentiles, become a Jew. But now, of course, the gospel is opening up. You don't know, you can remain a Gentile as, and be equal standing with a Jew, though not circumcised in the flesh, you've both got circumcised hearts. But if you're a Jew who is circumcised without a circumcised heart, you're under the same judgment as Gentiles who disobey God. With that background, Look at the way in which Paul speaks at the end of uh, of chapter 2, verse uh, 28. A person is not a Jew if they are only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart, by the spirit, not by the written code of the flesh. Such a man's praise is not from God, sorry, is not from men, but from God. Read that verse again. Such a person's praise is not from men, but from God. Now, there's a bit of a play on words here which you may not immediately grasp. The word Jew, of course, comes from Judah. Judah was the son of Rachel and Jacob. Yehuda in Hebrew means, I praise God. That's what Rachel said when she delivered Judah. Now, Paul turns this on his head. He says, the true Jehudahite, 
is not just the one who praises God, but the one whom God praises. That's true for you. God praises you. That's why God allows you to be tested and tempted. God himself does not tempt you. Satan is the one who tempts us. But God supplies us with sufficient grace to resist temptation. One of the hardest verses in the Bible, in my view, is in 1 Corinthians 10, when Paul says, note that whenever temptation comes to you, no temptation is not common to man, with the temptation, God will give you the ability to withstand. Did you realise that? It's devastating. Because when we sin, we can never say, the devil made me do it. And we can never say, God didn't give us enough grace to withstand it. Whenever we sin, we're being fools. We're not being wise. The problem is, as I said before, sin will be with us for the rest of this life. It's only the new heavens and new earth where sin will be removed, where every tear shall be wiped away and death shall be no more. And of course, temptation will be no more. One of the big differences between the Garden of Eden and the new heavens and new earth is the Garden of Eden, although sinless, was not perfect because temptation existed. But the new heavens and new earth, there'll be no temptation. Jesus, of course, was tempted just like we were, but without sin. Jesus lived the life that neither you nor I could live and died the death that you and I deserve. Jesus underwent that suffering. Jesus was tested because God trusted Jesus just as Jesus trusted God the Father. For we who are the saints of God, for we who are the bride of Christ, for we who are joined to him, God praises us. That's extraordinary. Just as God could, dis could use Job as a trophy of his grace to Satan, God can do the same to you. And when you're tempted, be wise. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank for the way in which even through the character of Job, you can teach us more about yourself. But we thank you above all for the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our saviour, to take on human flesh in our place and to die a death in our place. And you have made him the wisdom of God. And for us to proclaim that to others, but for us to imbibe it in ourselves that we might know what true wisdom is and that we might continue to trust and obey you for the glory of yourself. Amen.